Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about thermodynamics and the two laws of thermodynamics and work some examples using those. So let's start with as we would the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us that the change in internal energy of a system is equal to a combination of two things, the net heat transfer into the system minus the net work done on the system. So we can say that delta u, which is the change in internal energy, is the change in heat, the net heat transfer, minus the net work done on the system. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at some net energy, net heat into the system and some work done by the system. And if we subtract those two, that gives us the change of the change in the internal energy of this system. Now Q itself is equal to the difference between uh, the heat in minus the heat out. So there will always be heat coming in. There will be some amount of heat coming out. The net net heat is what we are looking for. There will be work out and work in. And again, it is just the net work that we are looking for. So we're looking at this. This is essentially a statement of conservation of energy. And if the system is in thermal equilibrium, then energy is conserved. And we will see the first law of thermodynamics here. So let's go ahead and look at an example of this. And what we see here, we have a system that we've demonstrated with 40 joules heat transfer to the system while the system does 10 joules of work. Later on, there is a heat transfer of 25 joules out of the system while four joules of work is done on the system. And we're looking for the net change in internal energy. So we have our diagram here, which again, you will find quite helpful to try to keep track of everything that is going on. And we've tried to summarize it here. So let's go ahead and look, but let's go ahead and do the calculation and show that here's what we know. So energy done is 20 as 40 joules is done here and 10 joules of work is done. And then later on, there is a heat transfer uh, out of the system. So here it is a heat transfer to the system. Here is the transfer out of the system. So that's where the negative sign comes in. And while four joules of work is done on the system. So we're looking at two different things. So our first one is energy coming in and a certain amount of work being done. The second one is the energy is going out and a certain amount of work is done on the system. So we have our values there and let's go ahead and calculate we need to find the net heat and the net work and that just sums these two and that's why it's very important to get your positive and negative signs correctly so our net heat is 40 joules minus 25 joules which would be 15 joules and the net work is 10 joules minus 4 joules which is 6 joules and that means that our change in internal energy is just the difference between these two Q minus W or 15 joules minus six joules, which will give you nine joules for the change in internal energy. So again, very important to keep track of the signs and look at what is coming in and what is going out of the system that will help you keep everything organized. So let's look at an example of what we call a heat engine, which is a device that uses heat energy, some kind of heat energy to do work. And some examples of those would be things like a car engine or a steam turbine. The work depends on the path that is taken to get through this. So this is our heat engine shown here. Some number of heat comes in, some number of heat comes out, and some amount of work is done by the heat engine. So we use what is called a PV diagram here. And let's take a look at that. Here we have that. And a PV diagram shows pressure on the one axis and volume on the other axis. So we're going to look at the paths as we go around this. We would look at the paths as we work our way around this box as pressure and volume are changed in this kind of cyclic path. 
And if you're moving horizontally, those are constant pressure. Those are what we call isobaric. And that means the pressure is not changing. And if you note, the pressure has some value. When you're moving horizontally, the pressure at A is exactly the same as the pressure at B. Now on the vertical paths, the pressure is changing, but the volume is changing, called isochoric. So in that case, the, the volume is exactly the same, but we are changing the pressure. And we can do calculation as we go around this to look at the amount of work being done. The work on each path is equal to the pressure multiplied by the change in volume. So note, it depends on the change in the volume, meaning if the volume is not changing for these vertical paths, then no work is done. So the vertical paths are not doing any work and we'll find as we calculate that those values will come out to be zero. Let's go ahead and look at an example of this to try to understand it better. And we will find that we are going to do try to calculate the total work done in this cyclical path shown. So in the cyclical path, you go from A to B to C to D and back to A again. And the pressures are given here. So the pressure between pressure at A and B is 1.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per square meter. The pressure down here for this path is 2 times 10 to the 5th newtons per square meter. And the change in volume is 500 cubic centimeters. So when the volume changes, then the, the volume changes 500 cubic centimeters. So we have our diagram here to help us get started. And we can go ahead and put everything together. What do we know? Well, we know the two pressures that are settled there that are the pressures at the top path a between a and b and the pressure at the bottom path between c and d we know that the change in volume is 500 cubic centimeters and do note of course we have to convert that into cubic meters to get it to si units to be able to use it with the problem so always make sure you're looking to make sure things are converted to si units now we can look at the work along each path. We look at each one individually. And here for the first path, the work is always given by the pressure times the change in volume. Well, we know the pressure between A and B. And we know the volume change that is given. And that gives us 750 joules worth of work that is done. Now we can continue and look at the second path. The second path is between B and C. Well, between B and C, we don't have a pressure because the pressure is changing, but the change in volume is zero. So whatever the pressure is, times zero is going to give you zero. And no work is done along the BC part of the path. On the CD part of the path, again, we can calculate and we have a different pressure given here. And we have a volume. Now note that the volume is negative here. Why is the volume negative? Because it is decreasing. Up here, volume increased. Down here, volume is decreasing. So it's decreasing back to where it started. So the amount of work is negative 100 joules when we multiply those out. So the work of DA is again 0 because the change in volume is 0. So we can add those up together and get a total of 650 joules of work done along that path. So again, we just need to look at each stage individually. And remember that those that are vertical where the volume does not change, do no work. Now we want to also mention reversible processes. In a reversible process, the system and the environment can return to their original states followed by following the reverse path. So that would happen only in ideal conditions. This will not happen when there are any dissipative forces such as friction or turbulence. So if there is no friction, a ball rolling would be able to 
to return its path and be able to return to exactly its original state. But because of things like friction and atmospheric resistance, no process in, in this case would ever really be reversible. Now let's go ahead and look briefly at the second law of thermodynamics which says that heat will not transfer spontaneously from a cool object to a hot one. In order to transfer heat from a cool object to a hot one, you need to do work. And we know this that many processes do occur spontaneously in only one direction. They are irreversible. So you cannot go backwards when the heat is being transferred. Mechanical energy can be completely converted to thermal energy. But you cannot do the reverse. You cannot convert thermal energy completely into mechanical energy. And that's just saying essentially that you're going to lose a little bit of energy and that no process can be 100% efficient. So for example, the air can spread out through a container through a room as you puff the air out into a vacuum and it will spread out relatively uniformly. The, the air will not co condense again into one corner of the area to which it was expelled. It is going to spread out. So you cannot get that material coming back in back into the same condition. Things are going to go towards a lesser ordered state. Now, when we look at this, we can express the second law in a couple of different ways. First is that heat transfer occurs spontaneously from higher to lower temperatures, but never spontaneously in the reverse direction. You will never see heat going without be, work being done. You will never see heat going from a, a colder object to a hotter object. When we look at heat engines, we want a high efficiency and we'll look at efficiency here in a bit. And we want to minimize the amount of lost heat. So we generate a certain amount of heat. Some of that does work. We want work to be as close as we can to the amount of heat produced. And we want Q sub C here to be as small as possible. So ideally, in an ideal world of perfect efficiency, QC would be zero. However, that will not happen. Even there are no perfectly efficient engines. Now, the second expression of the second law says that it is impossible for any system for heat transfer from a reservoir to completely convert work. And that would be in a cyclical process in which the system returns to its initial state. It's saying the same thing we've talked about with efficiency. It, you cannot get completely convert the work. You cannot take that heat and completely convert it to work. There is always going to be some amount of heat lost. And the more efficient the engine, the less, in, less heat will be lost. But there's always going to be some heat lost. So let's look at examples of a couple of cyclical processes here. It is a system that brings the system back to its original state at the end of each cycle. So there is a net amount of work done, which is the heat produced minus the heat that is expelled. And what we want to look for is the efficiency. The efficiency is the work divided by QH. And we can write this in several different ways. And if we know that work is just the difference of these two here, we can rewrite it as the efficiency is 1 minus QC. This is the waste divided by the heat produced. So the smaller QC is, the higher the efficiency. If QC was 0, the efficiency would be 1. That would be a perfectly efficient in engine. However, the efficiency can never be won. Some energy is always going to be lost. So we so we can go ahead and look at an example of this, which shows a coal power plant. And we're going to calculate the efficiency. We're going to find the work done by the power station and the efficiency. In a single day, the station has a heat transfer from coal that is burned of 2.5 times 10 to the 14th joules. 
and a transfer into the environment of 1.48 times 10 to the 14th joules. So that is the amount of heat that is used that is input into the system. And this is the waste heat. This is what is transferred into the environment. So what's left over is what actually produces useful energy. So let's go ahead and put what we know. We know that QH is the input. That's how much energy is put into the system 2.5 times 10 to the 14th. And we know QC what's going out as waste is 1.48 times 10 to the 14th. Now we can go ahead and remember that the work is equal to the difference between these two or that the work is equal to then 1.02 times 10 to the 14th joules. And the efficiency is then W, which we've just calculated here. So W divided by QH, which was the original. And if we calculate those, what we find is that the efficiency is about 40.8%. So we divide those two, we get 0 0.408. And to convert that to a percentage, we want to mark it as 40.8% mark it times 100. And that would give us the efficiency of a coal power plant 40.8% of the energy produced by burning coal is what goes into useful work by that heat engine. So that's an example of using this to calculate the efficiency of a heat engine. So let's go ahead and finish up and summarize. And what we talked about were the two laws of thermodynamics. First was the law of conservation of energy, that the change in energy is energy in less energy out. The second law was that a system can never convert heat to work with 100% efficiency. And finally, heat engines are devices that we use to do work on a system. So that concludes this lecture on thermodynamics. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone. And I will see you in class.